The Lord be with you. <clears throat> a reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. At the sight of the crowds, Jesus' heart was moved with pity for them, because they were troubled and abandoned, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the laborers are few. So ask the master of the harvest to send out laborers for his harvest. Then he summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure every disease and every illness. The names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon from Cana and Judas Iscariot, who would betray him. Jesus sent out these twelve after instructing them thus, Do not go into pagan territory, into a Samaritan town. Go, rather, to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, make this proclamation. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse lepers, drive out demons. Without cost you have received. Without cost, you are to give. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the first reading, we have, we encounter the Israelites having left Egypt. They're with Moses, they're in the desert. And they're being, uh, God is working on them really hard. And it's not an easy go. And God is trying to instruct them. He's pulled them out. They've already, they've seen the miracle of passing through the Red Sea. They've seen all the plagues that hit, that hit uh, the Egyptians. But at this moment, so far, their identity is kind of like, well, we're the, we're the Israelites and we're the descendants of Abraham. It wasn't that they really thought of themselves as, we are the chosen people. But that's going to come. Because that's exactly what God is working on in them in this moment. And so right now, the, the scene we, we listen to is Moses goes up Mount Sinai, as he does several times while they're, while they're out there. And God tells them, okay, go down and tell them, I've chosen you. You are to be for me a special people, a sacred people. I'm taking you, I'm setting you apart to be a kingdom of priests, like all of them, a holy people, a special nation. I was talking to a, a, a young man who was on his way into the church, and he had grown up in a, a completely uh, Hindu uh, family in, in um in India, and, and and of all the things that I was asking him, so, uh, I mean, he was, uh, he was at, in the RCIA program, and he, of all the things that he was, had questions about, or you know, sometimes, well, what's the role of the Blessed Virgin Mary? I don't know this about contraception. And that, that wasn't the thing that, like, he most made him want to scratch his head. It's like, well, well how, come, how come the Israelites got to be the chosen people? What about, what about my people? I mean, weren't they special too? It's like, wow, I never thought about that. I mean, it takes someone coming in from the outside to, to think of things like that. But it's a legit question. So why them? It wasn't that they were the holiest people, the most talented, uh, with the, the, the fastest, strongest, smartest. It, it wasn't anything of that. And it also wasn't the fact that they were suffering more than anybody else. Because they weren't the only people that was enslaved at that period of time. There would have been other peoples in other countries in enslavement. I mean, God says, I've heard the cry of your people, but, but there's a lot of cries coming from a lot of other parts of the world too. So that can't be it fully either. So that already tells us something, that God's choice, yes, it's for them, but there's probably something bigger going on here. And what he does with them in the, in the desert is, 
is part uh, is instructive for us to now. And I'm going to connect this here with the gospel. But but what does he do? He gives them the, the Ten Commandments. That's one of the things, the many things that he did. Well, to, to us, the Ten Commandments might seem pretty obvious. Thou shalt not kill. Okay, yeah, yeah. What's, what's the big mystery about that? Thou shalt not commit adultery. Yeah, yeah, sure, I get that. I mean, people do, but um, they're not proud of it usually. And and okay, thou shalt, I mean, and these, these, these things, thou shalt not steal. I said, like, yeah, yeah, okay. But, but it wasn't quite so no-brainer back then. We take it for granted because we've, we've, been, we've grown up in a culture that mostly permeated by a lot of those, those Judeo-Christian values. But that wasn't permeated around the world back then. Not even in the Israelites. That's why God had to make it explicit. And as you know, it wasn't just, okay, here you go, the Ten Commandments, and we're all set, we're done, we're out of here. Now go out and teach, no, no. They had some big ups and downs. They started to practice a little bit, and then went back down. Started a little bit better, and then back down. Tripping and falling. And it took them years to start to, and they never really fully got it. But by the time you get to Jesus, several thousand years later, it's becoming more gelled into the culture. Because they, they had a, the whole Babylonian exiles because they weren't living it. It took work. It took suffering. Recalling, ah, that's why it's not working out for us. Because we've forgotten these things. Or we stopped. We didn't forget. We just stopped wanting to live these things. And so their life would go from miserable in Egypt, slaves not just to the Egyptians, but to sin, as were the Egyptians. And to all these things that we take for granted about what makes life holy and dignified and righteous and, and integrated and whole. They had to learn those things and work on it and, 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 and incorporate it into their lives, into their laws, into their religious practice, into their, their cultural mores and, and all these things. God saw that the world was putrefying. It was not the way he intended it to be when he created it. So he says, I'm going to start with the Israelites. A few, a small. And from there, we're going to make it grow. The culmination of that first phase comes with our Lord Jesus Christ. Because from there, it's intended, our God himself is coming down. From there, it's intended to spread out. But what well, we see that happening in miniature form in the gospel right here during his public ministry, it, it's almost like the same thing. It's like an image for the bigger picture. Jesus shows up to this new location, and his heart was troubled because they were, and he had his moved, they had pity on them because they were abandoned and they were suffering, and he turns to his disciples, the ones who chose, and says, listen, this is what I've called you for. This is what I've been working in. This is why I've been teaching you these things. I, I want you to be my hands, my feet, to teach, to form, to console, to heal, cast out demons, proclaim the gospel. Were those 12 that he picked the best, the brightest, the smartest, the holiest? Uh-uh. And they didn't even get it all either. I mean, even you remember there's a scene where, where Jesus preaches about divorce and, and, and Peter himself, the first of the apostles, you know, come on, really? Are we going to, are we going to try to do that? I mean, if that's the case, it's better that we just don't even get married. Peter, the first of the apostles, he struggled with the teaching of his Lord. He'd come around later. Our Lord wanted that, his, his love, his salvation. He looks at looking around, not just seeing those people right in front of him, but he's also thinking of larger 2,000 years to later, us here today. He knows that the world needs this, his message. And he's chosen 12, and not just to stop with them, just the way he chose the Israelites, that that would continue on. So he's saying, okay, now I want this church that I founded. You are the holy people. 
You are the chosen ones. I've set you aside. I'm teaching you. I want to form you. I'm healing you so that you can be salt and light and healing for the world. With these men as your leaders, as fallen and as just as much as everybody else is. Because it's his power that's working through his power to heal and save and cast out demons. What God did with Israel, pulling them out of Egypt, what Jesus did right with those around him, choosing a few and preaching to right there. And in Israel, he really didn't go farther than that. So he also does today through the church. It's meant to change the world. It's meant to be healing. Well, how's that going? Well, a lot of work to go. Just like with Israel. It took a long time for them to get it. It takes a long time for the Catholic Church to fully, even within those who are baptized Catholics and in Catholic culture, it takes a long time for all of this to kind of gel together to form a, a truly holy Christian society. And today, obviously, we've got plenty to work on. For example, how long did it take us to get rid of slavery? By the way, you don't see that slavery being cast out. I mean, it didn't happen in other countries. It happened in a Christian culture. But it took us 1,800 some years to get it done for us to realize, wait a minute, maybe we really shouldn't be treating these people this way. And even then, inside a Christian culture, took a lot, it took a whole, in this, in this country, took a whole civil war. It took many decades of protests and prayer and, and, we're, and, and so much resistance. And this is among Christians. So if there's that, and that's just one issue. There's a lot of other issues out there. Obviously, that one's not so bad today as it was back then. Not here, at least. But what God is trying to do through these different things, he's trying to purify us. He's trying to heal us, trying to give us new dignity. So all the different, it's not just these moral laws and moral teachings that we're supposed to, well, I, got, I guess I kind of have to do this because I'm supposed to. God looks at our culture today. He looked at it back then. Our Lord wants to transform it. Because he sees what the suffering is and he knows what the cure is. And so he asks us to listen, to be open to this message. And sometimes it really challenges us. And it might be a message that we flat out don't agree with. Even though, yes, we're Catholic. Yes, we're sitting in the pew here. But this is the work of salvation that our Lord came. came. He, didn't want, he loves us too much to leave us like we are and just to kind of follow our own ideas. And it, he's, he, he knows how we tick. And he wants to transform that, redeem that, heal that. And maybe you've even experienced in your own lives as that happens, the joy and peace that comes from that. I was just at a, a conference on... Um, but it was Wednesday night. It was over here at the Sheen Center. And they had a panel of speakers. And it was, it was about, uh, it was, the theme was, because it's uh, from a city, country standpoint, Pride Month. As Catholics, this is the month of the Sacred Heart. But anyways, the theme was that and discuss, okay, let, let's, let's delve into this and let's, let's see, let's, let's honor what can be honored, but let's purify what ought to be purified. And one of the gentlemen was there was gave a very personal witness about how he had been absolutely transformed through our Lord, through the sacraments. And it lives a wonderful, holy, happy, joyful, chaste life now. Because he had an encounter with the Lord that challenged him and transformed him. And he opened his heart and he opened his mind he would point to that moment and say, I was saved. And he didn't even know the, the joy and the goodness and the uprightness that, that he could experience. He didn't even know it was there, but his heart longed for it. 
they desired it and they wanted it somehow. Not, but initially not even identifying as, oh yeah, what the Catholic Church is, forget it. It was a journey. So we ask our Lord to continue to send shepherds that will shepherd his flock. But just like the Israelites were intended to be his voice, his healing, his holy people, so are you intended to be his voice, his healing, his holy people, to go out and be a witness, an instrument of God's grace and his love. Let it challenge you, first of all. And, and the parts that maybe aren't a challenge, you will we'll share that. Share that. You're not just Catholic for yourself, for your own redemption, which it is. You're also Catholic because of somebody else who you know that our Lord wants us in his, in his wanting to share the joy of, of salvation, wanting to use you to, in a certain way, reach out to them. There isn't a single one of you here that God does not have in some way intended to help somebody else experience joy and happiness and transformation and salvation that comes through the sacraments, that comes through the joy of the gospel. There's not one of you that that's not the case. So be generous with your yes. When he calls, give a yes. This is also a great gospel for, the, for anyone who's ever even thought about becoming a, a priest or a consecrated. Be generous and give a yes, because there's so much that God wants to do through us. He's looking to save the world. Yes, it's that big. And this is what he's got. Not the best, not the brightest, not the fastest, not the holiest. But this is who he's chosen, you and me. And it's going to work. It's going to be slow. But soul by soul, year by year, decision by decision, we allow God's grace to come in and transform us. It begins to happen. It continues to grow. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.